Good morning and welcome to our online gathering for worship for Timberton Baptist Church and all those that are joining us from wherever, whether it's Timberton, Devon or anywhere around the country or the world, a warm welcome to you all. If we were gathering actually in person as we were last week at Timberton Baptist Church building, it would be 11 o'clock now and so we're going to uh, have a two minute silence because today is Remembrance Sunday where around the country we stop and consider and remember those that have suffered greatly in all manner of wars in the past right up to the present. So let's do that together, two minutes to reflect and to pray. As I was thinking and reflecting in those two minutes, I was reminded of a conversation many, many years ago with my French grandfather, who uh, lived during the Second World War. Uh, he was an aircraft engineer uh, working on planes at a, a French airbase. And that particular airbase was taken over by the Germans and they were forced at gunpoint to work on the German planes. Um, so you can imagine how that, what sort of experience that would have been. Uh, the pressure, the, the fear, the concern. And uh, talking with, with my French grandfather about that, he was very honest about how that experience left him in no doubt about the reality of evil in the world and the devil. We were talking about why myself personally, as a Christian, was so serious about following Jesus and what difference that makes in the realities and the struggles and the sadness of life. And like I've just said, he was saying he was in no doubt, my French grandfather, about the reality of evil and the devil. But as he's reflected on life, he was thinking, you know, well, is there a God? What difference does he make in the realities of war and devastation and sadness? And he felt really sort of very strongly about, for him, it would have feel hypocritical to turn to Jesus at the end of his life, where he'd lived life his own way with him in charge. And he really, really struggled with that. And so I said to him, you know what? On the day Jesus died, he had two others being put to death next to him, two criminals. And one of those criminals had his eyes open to who Jesus really was. And he turned to Jesus and said, 
Jesus, will you remember me when you enter paradise? And Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. Even at that very last moment of life, someone is able to experience hope and forgiveness and newness of life when they turn to Jesus and ask for his forgiveness and ask for, the, for him to save them. And that's what I shared with my French grandfather as he reflected on the Second World War. So today, um, on this Remembrance Sunday, let us turn to some words from Scripture, from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which are vital remembrance as we think on what is important to remember. In the Christian faith, this is what we're reminded of as being of first importance, primary importance. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul explains the good news. Brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the good news I preached to you. You received it and have put your faith in it because you believe the good news, you are saved. But you must hold firmly to the message I preached to you. If you don't, you have believed it for nothing. What I received, I passed on to you and it is the most important of all. Here is what it is. Christ died for our sins, just as scripture said he would. He was buried. He was raised from the dead on the third day, just as scripture said he would be. He appeared to Peter. Then he appeared to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 believers at the same time. Most of them are still living, but some have died. He appeared to James. Then he appeared to all the apostles. Last of all, he also appeared to me. I was like someone who wasn't born at the right time or in a normal way. I am the least important of the apostles. I am not even fit to be called an apostle. I tried to destroy God's church. But because of God's grace, I am what I am. And his grace was not wasted on me. No, I have worked harder than all the other apostles. But I didn't do the work. God's grace was with me. So whether it was I or the other apostles who preached to you, that is what we preach. And that is what you believed. So a day of remembrance. Yes, we remember the huge sacrifices made around the world at times of war to try and bring peace. But as Christians, as followers, as disciples of Jesus, we may remember time and time again, the most important thing to remember, the greatest sacrifice of Jesus on the cross to deal with the greatest problem of all, our desire to remain in charge and to not allow God to be in charge of our lives. Let's pray together. Loving God, thank you that afresh today, particularly on this Remembrance Sunday, you are so faithful and kind to remind us of what is of greatest importance. Thank you for giving us the scriptures. Thank you for um, working through your church to remind all humanity of the amazing gift of your son, to bring us hope, to deal with the brokenness uh, and the pain that we so often cause one another by living life our own way. You understand all of this, Lord, and I pray that um, as we continue in this online gathering together, that you would continue to speak to us through the worship songs that we shall hear and join in with, in the prayers, in the listening to, to scripture, and in the message preached. Lord, please work through it all. Continue to transform us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, for those listening that have uh, children in your households, um, may I encourage you to uh, go to another YouTube channel, um, separate to the, the Tiverton Baptist Church YouTube channel. 
it is the virtual Sunday School uh, YouTube channel um, where you will be able to hear today's story, especially for uh, families and children and young people, which will include craft as well. So please do give that a look in and join uh, and join in with with all the activities. We're going to uh, uh, join together now in our first worship song and uh, see you again shortly. notices particularly for our local fellowship at Tiverton Baptist Church um, please do refer to um, emails received um, but also to add that at the end of this online gathering there will be a special zoom meeting for anyone from the church fellowship to join us again refer to the email for the relevant login details to join us for half an hour of meeting together online look forward to seeing many of you later on. We're going to, going to now have a time of prayer and the focus for our prayers is going to be from Psalm 107 and uh, you will see the words of that psalm up on your screens and um, the reading of that psalm is going to be shared between myself and Nat. Give thanks to the Lord because he is good. His faithful love continues forever. That's what those who have been set free by the Lord should say. He set them free from the power of the enemy. He brought them back from other lands. He brought them back from east and west, from north and south. Some of them wandered in deserts that were dry and empty. They couldn't find their way to a city where they could settle down. They were hungry and thirsty. Their lives were slipping away. Then they cried out to the Lord because of their problems, and he saved them from their troubles. He led them straight to a city where they could settle down. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love. Let them give thanks for the miracles he does for his people. He give those who are thirsty all of the water they want. He give those who are hungry all of the good food they can eat. Others lived in the deepest darkness. They 
suffered as prisoners in iron chains. That's because they hadn't obeyed the words of God. They had refused to follow the advice of the Most High God. So he made them do work that was hard and bitter. They tripped and fell, and there was no one to help them. Then they cried out to the Lord because of their problems, and he saved them from their troubles. He brought them out of the deepest darkness. He broke their chains off. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love. Let them give thanks for the miracles he does for his people. He breaks down gates that are made of bronze. He cuts through bars that are made of iron. Others were foolish. They suffered because of their sins. They suffered because they wouldn't obey the Lord. They refused to eat anything. They came close to passing through the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord because of their problems, and he saved them from their troubles. He gave his command and healed them. He saved them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love. Let them give thanks for the miracles he does for his people. Let them sacrifice thank offerings. Let them talk about what he has done as they sing with joy. Others sailed out to the ocean in ships. They traded goods in the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord. They saw the miracles he did on the ocean. He spoke and stirred up a storm. It lifted the waves high. They rose up to the heavens. Then they went down deep into the ocean. In that kind of danger, the people's boldness melted away. They were unsteady, like those who get drunk. They didn't know what to do. Then they cried out to the Lord because of their problems, and he brought them out of their troubles. He made the storm as quiet as a whisper. The waves of the ocean calmed down. The people were glad when the ocean became calm. Then he guided them to the harbour they were looking for. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love. Let them give thanks for his, the miracles he does for his people. Let them honour him among his people who gather for worship. Let them praise him in the meeting of the elders. He turned rivers into deserts. He turned flowing springs into thirsty ground. He turned land that produced crops into a salty land where nothing could grow. He did it because the people who lived there were evil. He turned the desert into pools of water. He turned the dry and cracked ground into flowing springs. He brought hungry people there to live. They built a city where they could settle down. They planted fields and vineyards and produced large crops. He blessed the people and they greatly increased their numbers. He kept their herds from getting smaller. Then the number of God's people got smaller. They were brought low by trouble, suffering and sorrow. The one who looks down on proud nobles made them wander in a desert where no one lives. But he lifted needy people out of their suffering. He made their families increase like flocks of sheep. Honest people see it and are filled with joy. But no one who is evil has anything to say. Let those who are wise pay attention to these things. Let them think about the Lord's great love. When Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get his wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offence at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour except in his own town and in his own home. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus, and he said to his attendants, This is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, 
For John had been saying to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because they considered John a prophet. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guests and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here, on a platter, the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away, so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said and he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and, beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me! Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? When they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak. 
and all who touched it were healed. of scripture that we've seen and heard on the screen let's ask for the Lord's help to teach us Lord we just thank you again that the scriptures and particularly Matthew's gospel that we've been looking at over the weeks is not just simply words from human origin but you tell us in the scriptures that all scripture is breathed by you is inspired by you and is able to transform us um, and so we ask for your help now by your Holy Spirit as we think on this next section in Matthew's Gospel. Amen. Last week we focused on the amazing transformation of Jesus healing a man with a crippled hand. And we also thought about how Jesus continues to deal with our own crippled positions in life. Um, the way that we can be blind and deaf and we looked at how um, the Lord Jesus is able to deal with that even when we don't realise that we're not seeing things or hearing things or responding or living in the way that the Lord Jesus is able to help us live. So this next part of Matthew's Gospel, uh, the end of chapter 13 going into chapter 14, is again a focus on what the Lord does in a human being to bring them to that place of really being able to worship and live fully for the Lord. Um, and some important context before that is in chapter 13, we are giving that well-known, very important parable of the soils. And the Bible itself says that that parable is the key to our understanding and unlocking um, all, of the, all of the other parables that Jesus tells. And of course, a parable is a story with a deep, deep meaning that the Lord Jesus reveals to those serious seekers after him. So that parable of the soils is a vital one 
that described the responses of human hearts. Four main responses that are very, very important that include all of us listening. The first one is the hard heart response that rejects the good news, the gospel of Jesus. And it is evident here in this passage from the people of Nazareth at the end of chapter 13 and in Herod the king in chapter 14. There they reject the good news of Jesus and what Jesus stands for and what he is, he, he is proclaiming and demonstrating. That's the hard heart. The shallow heart are all those people that believe in Jesus from a self-centered perspective because he provides for our needs first and foremost. And the feeding of the 5,000, you think many people followed because their tummies were filled. He provides food. And so the crowds, lots of people follow from a self-centered focus. There's no real depth in their faith, which is then evidenced later when things get tough and they abandon Jesus because he doesn't meet that what they think is their primary need. The third one is the divided heart. And we see that in one of the close followers of Jesus, Judas Iscariot, who rejected Jesus due to the ways and wealth of the world, choking out his faith. And we're told in the scriptures and in the gospels that he was secretly stealing from the money anyway. He was already swayed by the greater desire for money. And fourth and finally, we have the receptive heart. And this is the disciples that trust and follow Jesus fully. And they rise to new heights of faith as they grow in their relationship with Jesus. And the Gospels talk about um, a fruitful life that produces 30, 60, 100 fold from what one, one starts with. A fruitful, productive life from a receptive heart. So that, that background, that context is really, really important as we focus on what the Lord does in a human heart to bring them to the place of worshipping him. Um, how he works with the hard heart, the shallow heart, the divided heart and the receptive heart. And here in Matthew chapter 14, we're given various pictures of belief and unbelief in Jesus, the response of a human heart. So in Matthew chapter 13, uh, verse 53 to 58, we have the first picture of unbelief, where Jesus is rejected in his hometown as Nazareth. And that's quite astounding to think, well, this is his home turf. Surely they know him, they know what he's about, they've seen him growing up. Um, yet it's because of that that they actually dismiss what he, he, he's, he's saying. They think, well, he's the carpenter's son. We know all about him. You know, there's nothing really you special about him. He's just, a, he's just a good guy. He's just a good teacher. And yet there are things that challenge and convict. They're seeing him doing amazing supernatural things. But their resistance is such that we're told here that Jesus wasn't able to perform many miracles in Nazareth because of their unbelief because of their hardened hearts. The second picture we have of unbelief is the shocking one with the forerunner of Jesus, the prophet John the Baptist. And this level of unbelief is, results in something quite horrific to silence the prophetic voice pointing people to Jesus. And that resistance results in literally the beheading of God's prophet, John the Baptist, a very shocking one in an attempt to silence the conviction of the good news of the gospel. But God's truth is not so easily silenced because it keeps on coming back in different forms to challenge our, our heart uh, and where our worship lies. So those two pictures there are of unbelief. But we also have in Matthew chapter 14, two pictures of belief and growth in faith. And this is where we come to the famous feeding of the 5,000. Um, uh, but the actual number is far more than that because that's just the counting of the men, not including the women and the children. 
The impact of this amazing miracle of God feeding such a vast crowd is the growth in the disciples' faith. They discover that Jesus is the one who truly sustains and satisfies our souls. Not just our physical needs for hunger, but much more than that. For he is the true bread that meets our deepest need in his church. And uh, that is something that uh, followers of Jesus discover um, to increasing levels the more they begin to trust in him and put their faith in him. Jesus meets our needs above and beyond just the superficial ones that we may start with. And that raises a question for us uh, uh, again today. What level of spiritual and physical needs do we see around us locally and across the world? The obvious one, of course, stares us in the face now that we're in this second period of lockdown. Huge need, financial pressures, with being out of work, places around our towns closing, back on lockdown. The emotional needs we have of isolation, the fear of the unknown, what's the future going to hold? How are we going to come through this? And that links directly again, thinking of today being Remembrance Sunday, where we remember other times of hardship throughout history. Many of us, perhaps in senior years, can think of times where that, that has been dire and we've wondered how we're going to ride this storm. How are we going to come through this? And many across this country that know and love Jesus will be able to testify that the Lord has been faithful in the most difficult of times and he will be faithful again now. And that's why this passage in Matthew chapter 14 is such an encouragement because the multitude of people that were following Jesus, gathering the crowds, they came to discover that Jesus is able to meet our deepest needs, all of our needs, whatever level. I encourage you to bring your need. I encourage myself, whatever those needs are, to bring them to Jesus afresh today because he is the one that is able to help us. And that there is the huge need everywhere for people to be fed the wonderful vaccine of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we started this gathering uh, this morning online by focusing on what is of primary importance, what is the most important message that we all need the world over. It's that Jesus has come into this world, sacrificed his life to deal with the sin problem of us being in charge and making a mess of things throughout history. Jesus understands all of that and he came and lived a perfect life and surrendered it all and died and conquered death and conquered the sin problem and rose again. And he calls people to follow him, to lay their lives down for him, for him to be in charge. That is the vaccine of the greatest problem in the world, the sin sick condition in this world today. And that brings a challenge for us afresh today. Are we going to follow Jesus? Are we going to continue to follow Jesus? Just like the crowds appearing to follow him. But the Lord alone knows the condition of our hearts. Are they hard hearts? Are they shallow hearts? Are they responsive hearts to him? Or there are, do we have divided hearts? We've got a picture on the screen you'll see here of a famous site where many, many tourists go year in, year out. Do you know what it is? It's the Niagara Falls. And the weight of water pouring over the, uh, uh, down, um, down below there, it's immense. It's such a picture of power. And uh, you'd be foolish if you stood there and were to say, well, where's the water? Where's the source of power? People would say to you, well, open your eyes. Look, it's right in front of you. Look at it all. Tons and tons of water gushing down the Niagara Falls and the power that's generated there. How much more would the Lord challenge us afresh today to look at Jesus? For he is the source of power and hope, even more than the Niagara Falls or any other natural wonder around the world that is created. But how much do we really believe that? How much do we know of that today? The Lord wants us to know that all the more fully. Yes, even now. 
A personal story um, from my own background. Uh, one of my brothers uh, challenged me um, about my level of trust when I was younger um, and younger in my faith and relationship with the, the Lord Jesus. He challenged me about the fact that if we really believe that Jesus is able to transform a human being and help anyone, whatever mess they may be in, then surely we should go out in the streets and tell them right now. And I said to my brother, whoa, what, what do you mean? Literally go out on the high street right now in Penge and South East London? Uh, well, and I made some excuses like, well, perhaps we need to be a little bit more prepared and perhaps we need to be more sure of what we believe in and, and all those thoughts and doubts start coming in. Do I really believe that Jesus is able to do the impossible, to transform anybody, to give hope to anybody? And the reality is, whatever my level of faith, he is able to do that. And my challenge from my brother all those years ago kind of revealed a certain shallowness for me, a shallowness in my own heart. And it's a, a challenge for, for, for us today. Do we ha um, know Jesus in that way to be able to say, yes, I know that Jesus is able to transform anybody, even me? Secondly, we have this picture of, of belief here in Matthew chapter 14 of the famous calming of the storm. And this story seems to be coming up quite a bit at the moment. Um, it's certainly come up for us at Tiverton Baptist Church. We have our messy church um, restarting last month. And we uh, encouraged our messy church families to focus on this true story. And what's so wonderful about this picture of belief, which starts from a place of unbelief, is that even in the craziest of storms where we fear for our lives and thinking, what on earth is going to become of me? God, do you care? We see in that story where the disciples, the close disciples, are, are, are shaking Jesus awake and saying, don't you care? We're going to die. And of course, Jesus demonstrates that of course he cares. And he's in control. And they don't need to be afraid. And he demonstrates his power and authority when he, he commands the wind and the waves to be calm and be still. And they obey him in that instant. And it becomes completely calm. And those disciples are left gobsmacked because they suddenly realise that they're in the boat with them. It's no ordinary human being, but rather this person, this Jesus, has power over the wind and the waves. He is the Son of God. And here we discover that Jesus, once again, is the King of Kings. He's sovereign over all. He has power over all over all trials and difficulties in life, even with this pandemic. And we're told elsewhere in scripture that Jesus constantly cares. He doesn't turn his back on us. He, in fact, right now, whilst we're listening to this on our service, he is praying, interceding for us in the middle of our trials. He weeps for us, especially in terms of the condition of our hearts if we're resistant to him. He weeps for us. He he prays, he, he, he earnestly longs that we would turn to him and discover how wonderful he is, that he can meet our deepest needs, that he can calm our storms, he can deliver us from whatever we're experiencing. And Jesus not only still storms, but he also uses storms as a pathway to a greater revelation of himself, just like those first disciples had. That calm and silence when their eyes are opened their understanding is brought to a greater depth. It's in the middle of the storm that the presence of Jesus Christ becomes all the more real. I wonder if you can say that. I wonder if I can say that in this continuing pandemic, in the continued, continuing fear and concern of the infection rate, people dying, becoming really ill. What's to become? of the future. When they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those in the boat worshiped Jesus. They said, you really are the son of God. When they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Who was they? 
it was Jesus and Peter, one of the closest disciples. He'd begun to trust Jesus, even in the midst of the storm. And the Lord Jesus was enabling him to do the impossible. But his eyes began to turn to the concerns around him, to the raging storm, how, how seriously scary the storm was. And then he began to sink. And he cried out to the Lord. And the Lord Jesus reached out and delivered him to safety, back in the boat. And it's in that moment that the rest of the disciples, Peter included, are wowed and respond with, wow, you really are the son of God. You really are able to help us. And this truth reminds uh, his disciples of what is said at the end of Matthew's gospel. In Matthew chapter 28 verse 20 where he, he promises to be with his disciples as they go to the ends of the earth with an unpopular gospel message. The good news of most primary importance, including on Remembrance Sunday, that Jesus Christ died for our sin-sick condition to conquer death and sin and to provide a way for us to follow him and to live life in all fullness. And Jesus has promised to be with his people to proclaim that message in all manner of ways around the world. So Jesus is our strength. He strengthens our faith. He focuses our faith on him. And how much we need to be helped and encouraged in that today. It says in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2, Fix your eyes upon Jesus, for he is the author and the finisher or perfecter of the faith. Jesus is our peace around us. There is the coming day when he will bring total and complete peace to his people. How we long for that, where there will be no more wars, no more pain or sickness or sadness, but the peace and the love of God reigning fully. This gives us encouragement to persevere in the midst of trials and temptations, to not give up because he is with us. He's promised to be with us through to his second coming his return so the, this last verse that we looked at in matthew 14 verse 33 you really are the son of god is the picture of true worship that comes from true belief in jesus the king of kings and that's what transforms a human heart it enables us to worship in the most richest and beautiful and wholesome of ways as our focus is turned on the Lord Jesus the most important source of worship not ourselves nothing else but the Lord so as we come to the end of this short message I encourage you and I to respond to this incomparable Jesus Christ just as in the pictures we've seen, may we not respond with unbelief, but rather with belief. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word in Matthew's Gospel. Thank you that in it, we see the whole breadth a mixture of human response from varying heart conditions from hardened hearts from shallow hearts to divided hearts to receptive hearts Lord you know the condition of our hearts and whether we right now acknowledge and honor you as the king who you really are who deserves full allegiance through full worship and glory please continue to open our eyes and work in our lives lord so that we may be brought to that place like those disciples in the boat after the calming of the storm that we may be able to declare you are the son of god have charge of my life no matter what the trials and the storms and the fears and the concerns lord jesus come and bring calm and hope 
in the midst of all of this. For we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to have a, a final worship song together now that helps us to continue to focus on this message of Jesus being uh, worthy of our worship. joy to be with you together in this way afresh today and some words from scripture to encourage us as we uh, continue through the rest of this day from Jude chap, uh, verse 24 and 25 give praise to the one who is able to keep you from falling into sin he will bring you into his heavenly glory without any fault. He will bring you there with great joy. Give praise to the only God. He is our saviour. Glory, majesty, power and authority belong to him. Give praise to him through Jesus Christ our Lord. Give praise to the one who was before all time, who now is and who will be forever. Amen. God bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you until we meet again. And may I encourage you once more, uh, we have a Zoom meeting uh, following this online service. We'd love to see you. Please uh, refer to your email for the login Zoom details. Look forward to seeing some of you there. God bless you.